grandmother and just even him at least there were some resources for him that really weren't there for her welcome to behind the pages Kate Redfield Jameson is with us today to uh, talk about her latest her latest book Kay is a psycho psychologist who specializes in the field of bipolar disorder. Her book is an exploration, a psychological exploration of the life of, of Robert Lowell, the famous poet. Welcome to our show today. Thank you, delighted to be here. And I'd like to start by having you tell us a little bit more about your book. Um, you didn't set out to do this as a biography per se. As a, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. It's, mm -hmm. It has ended up being a biography, but yeah. it started off being a, a study of, of his his mind and character and, of course, mm -hmm. his work, mm -hmm. but how he, he also had um, a very serious form of uh, bipolar illness in his time known as manic depressive illness. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in how that influenced his writing. Mm -hmm. He wrote a lot about it. He talked to his doctors about it, mm -hmm. um, but also how he dealt with it. I think that one of the things that doesn't get talked about uh, with patients who have mental illnesses, mm -hmm. what resources do people bring to bear in terms of character mm -hmm. um, and education, in, in terms of educating themselves about the illness and about life? Mm -hmm. The book opens uh, with a, a prologue, and that's centered on his great-great-grandmother, um, as she's actually en route to being brought to McLean Hospital, uh, where she ended up spending three years. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about her? Yes. Uh, Lowell always thought that his great-great-grandmother, mm -hmm. who had come originally for her family from the Orkney Islands, mm -hmm. was the source of poetry in, in the Lowell line, and mm -hmm. he, his family on his mother's side, while wow, the Winslows went back to the Mayflower, and his father's side, the Lowells almost then. But this side of the family on, on the Lowell side had mm -hmm. uh, come from Orkney, and there was mental illness throughout the family, as mm -hmm. there was uh, through some branches of the uh, Lowell family as well. Mm. And she, I was interested in trying to start the, the book with uh, the notion that this is, it's a hereditary illness, it runs mm -hmm. in families, it's relentless, but it's interesting. And what a tragic ending she had. She died insane. Mm -hmm. uh, she got the treatment that she could at the time. She got very good treatment. Um, but how it, how it was portrayed in the 19th century and how it was treated in the 19th century mm -hmm. was obviously very different than it is now. But I was interested in setting the stage mm -hmm. for the mental illness that would uh, come Robert Lowell's way, mm -hmm. but also her great interest in music and literature and the mm -hmm. arts, you know, that these things went together in their family. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you mentioned in your book, too, that there is a larger proportion of people connected to the creative arts that actually have bipolar disorder. Yes, that's right, and that's been, you know, speculated for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And um, more recently, uh, there have been a lot of biographical studies and studies of living artists and writers mm -hmm. finding a very disproportionate rate of bipolar illness and depression mm -hmm. in very creative people in the arts. Mm -hmm. But in the last 10 years, there have been very large systematic scientific studies of the relationship, again finding over tens of thousands of individuals a very much elevated rate of bipolar illness in mm -hmm. people in the creative fields. Is that something that is always diagnosed? Um, by bipolar disorder? No. Um, okay. yeah, it, well, you know, you wish that it w would be, and right. I think increasingly yeah. so. I think increasingly doctors and pediatricians in particular mm -hmm. are aware, that because it's an illness that hits young, uh, mm -hmm. the average age of onset is late, eight, late teens, early 20s, mm -hmm. that people are much more aware of it than they used to be. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to get treated early, so I yeah. think people are also much more aware of that, that this is an illness that takes an enormous toll if it isn't treated, and yes. it is very treatable. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, people are more aware of it. Are they as aware of it as they could be? Probably not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the time of his great-great-grandmother's um, illness, what was known about the disease then? 
well, it was, it was clearly known that it ran in families, that mm -hmm. it was hereditary. I mean, uh, the doctors uh, and the clinical scientists at, at, in the 19th century wrote about that as they had for, you know, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. They knew that it was um, not treatable by, by the way they had of treating it. They, they used morphine and opiates to calm people down when they were manic, mm -hmm. and they gave people um, different kinds of stimulants when they were depressed. So they weren't ideal treatments. The main treatment was to be put in a hospital, mm -hmm. and so you couldn't harm other people, you couldn't harm yourself, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. could get away from the stress of, of the regular world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert Lowell was uh, admitted to psychiatric facilities a number of times in, in his in his life. His write-downs usually followed periods of, of a lot of creativity. Uh, at what point would it just, would it actually hamper his work as opposed to enhance it? Well, I think uh, on almost every occasion, he was hospitalized uh, 20 times. And I mean, he was a great, great poet, and I mean, extraordinary poet, and wrote about difficult things and hard things in life mm -hmm. um, in a beautiful, highly disciplined way. So even though he had this very severe illness mm -hmm. and he would get often get start to get manic and he would talk about this to his uh, doctors. I, one of the things that I was able to, uh, through his family, get permission to look at his psychiatric and medical records. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was talked about with Lowell and his doctors was A, his terror of getting mad again, of becoming manic again, mm -hmm. but also that there was this early phase of mania where he would f get a lot of ideas for poetry. Mm -hmm. And then they would get very fragmented and completely out of control and, and, and mm -hmm. useless until he got well again mm -hmm. or was depressed and he could go back and rewrite and rework. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I was very interested in Lowell was this this relationship with his illness and his his art, mm -hmm. but also this iron discipline that he had. And I think that one of the things people who have uh, bad psychiatric illness often have is a remarkable capacity to regenerate mm -hmm. and to get back on their feet. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about that very much. We look at the illness, um, yeah. but we don't look so much at uh, the individuals who get the illness. Mm -hmm. Right, and the strength it has to continue to have a productive life, which he did. I mean, yes, this is quite. a man who, you know, wrote volumes of poetry and... And, and twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize and every mm -hmm. poetry award. And, and, and more than that, just a great poet who left mm -hmm. a huge mark on mm -hmm. the, his age and, mm -hmm. and subsequently. Yes. His his sequence of you know becoming manic, become, becoming more productive, and then manic to the point where he could no longer sit long enough to to finish a, a thought. Even how well does that fit into the usual sequence um, for people who have this this disease? Well, most people who have bipolar illness clearly aren't unusually creative, um, mm -hmm. and most people who are creative don't have bipolar illnesses. Rather, that there's a sort of a disproportionate rate there. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, it, it's the nature of the illness for people to start off just a quickening of thinking, mm -hmm. a uh, increased enthusiasm, decreased mm -hmm. sleep, and those kinds of things, mm -hmm. and then to get increasingly scrambled uh, after that so that when people are fully manic, they may hallucinate, they may have delusions, mm -hmm. they can't keep track of their thinking or their words mm -hmm. and become completely incoherent um, and out of control. So it's, a, it's an illness that creeps up on people. Mm -hmm. And for many people who have it, it feels good enough at the beginning of it mm -hmm. that they are seduced into believing um, that they're going to feel great and it's not going to get out of control. Well, what treatments were available for him in his time? Well, he 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 was he was born in 1917, mm -hmm. and he was first hospitalized uh, when he was uh, in in 1949. Okay. And in 1949, hospitalization was mm -hmm. a major treatment. Again, getting somebody just to be protected and protect mm -hmm. other people. But then he also had electroshock therapy, uh, which was uh, widely used at that time mm -hmm. for mania. Mm -hmm. and for severe depression. It still is widely used. Oh, um, is it effective? Yes, it's very effective. Okay. Um, it doesn't 
prevent future episodes. It's very effective. So if you have somebody who's acutely manic and mm -hmm. out of control or suicidally, morbidly suicidally depressed, mm -hmm. um, shock treatment has the benefit of working quickly, mm -hmm. uh, much more quickly than many other treatments and okay. more effectively. But it will not prevent a future episode from mm -hmm. coming. The great advantage, he then went on as, as the decades went by, he was mm -hmm. one of the, in the early uh, treatment here in the United States okay. with lithium. Mm -hmm. And so lithium has the advantage of yeah. preventing future episodes. Mm -hmm. So he kind of spanned mm -hmm. the treatment of bipolar illness. And that's what I was wondering, at what point was lithium you know, used as a prevention? And uh, although, of course, it only works if you stay on it. Uh, exactly, yeah, right. and most right. many people do not, at least mm -hmm. initially. I mean, Laura was very grateful uh, that mm -hmm. to lithium mm -hmm. and wrote about that extensively, that mm -hmm. he, it was the first time he'd stayed out of hospitals mm -hmm. uh, in his adult life was when he was on lithium. So mm -hmm. uh, he didn't see his illness as anything romantic. He thought right. that the early on when he got manic there were certain benefits, but for the most mm -hmm. part it was, it was completely disastrous to his life. Mm -hmm. And was he cooperative about staying on yes, his medication? Yes, he was. Uh -huh. um, toward the end of his life, he, he got sick from lithium, and then he didn't quite get his medication straightened out, mm -hmm. and then he died um, mm -hmm. of heart, heart disease. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, he, wa he was for the most part. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you know his mania did you know sometimes spur him on to, to working, but it also interrupted his his life a lot. Can you give any examples of what happened, different periods of his life? Well, when um, he, when I mean, he there was some violence, wasn't there? Yes, there was, points? and, and yeah. that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Violence isn't uncommon. It's one of the really many good reasons to get treated mm -hmm. um, is that people just do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, and I mm -hmm. think. One of the th reasons I wrote about Lowell, other than thinking he's a, f a fascinating, admirable man and a great mm. poet, is that I, th I think he struggled with all these issues that he did things when he was manic that he would never do when he was sane. Mm -hmm. And he felt enormous remorse and mm -hmm. shame and humiliation about what he had done. So he, at, on occasions he was violent. On occasions he said wildly destructive things to people and he was a great poet and very articulate, and mm -hmm. so he would say things that were deeply wounding, and mm -hmm. and you can't call those words back. You can right. show remorse, and you can, mm -hmm. and his friends understood this. I mean, they yeah. they understood that when he was saying, which was most of the time, mm -hmm. he was a soft-spoken gentleman who was kind and generous, and they loved him deeply, and they continued to love him. Mm -hmm. But when he got manic, he did what people who get manic do. He did a lot of things that he deeply mm -hmm. regretted. So it's one of those, you know, kind of philosophical issues of how much is somebody accountable for things mm -hmm. when they have an illness that makes them do things they wouldn't otherwise do. And really so young, one yeah. of the tragedies of Lowell's life is that mm -hmm. he had, he, he was terrified that he, this illness would come back, the mania mm -hmm. would come back, and that he would do things that he couldn't apologize enough for. Mm -hmm. And it did continue to come and back. And it did continue yeah. to come back until yeah. he was on lithium, yeah. Uh, did his did he have a more severe form of it than most people? I mean, how many? Because it sounds like it, it was uh, pretty frequent that he. You know. He had a, a very bad form of it. He mm -hmm. had a form, it, it, not the most severe form in terms of the depression. Mm -hmm. His depression was not as. He certainly had. He was depressed after every time he got manic. He, mm -hmm. he had, was depressed. But he didn't have the severity of many, that many mm -hmm. people have. He wasn't, he didn't kill himself. He wasn't suicidal deeply for mm -hmm. a long period of time. He had very, very bad manias. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, if it isn't treated, it's an illness that progresses and gets worse over time. So mm -hmm. that's what happened with Robert Lowell. Mm -hmm. And it was only when he was treated with lithium that that progression stopped. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you just tell us a little bit about the disease itself? Sure, it's genetic, mm -hmm. um, runs in families. It's a characterized by changes in mood and mm -hmm. thinking, and um, in in the capacity to use your head effectively. So when mm -hmm. people get depressed, they get very dis disinterested in things. So that things that ordinarily give them a lot of pleasure, they mm -hmm. 
remove themselves from life, they remove themselves from other people, they isolate themselves, mm -hmm. uh, they have very flat sense of feeling mm -hmm. or uh, a great deal of psychological pain, they ruminate a lot, they mm -hmm. may think about suicide, uh, they slow down. Mm -hmm. So it's like being a hibernating bear in many respects that people yeah. just completely slow down, very often sleep way too much mm -hmm. or not enough. Okay. And then mania is the flip of that. People get mm -hmm. energized. They think really fast. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of energy. They don't need as much sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and in both cases, people can get quite psychotic and think. Mm -hmm. And the goal of medication and treatment is to keep them in between those two <laughs> so that they're yes, and a little and bit more you know, even and, keel. And it's, yeah. uh, we have really pretty effective medications now. They're not mm -hmm. ideal, but they're a lot better than they used to be. Mm -hmm. What was it like for a person to be in a room with Robert Lowell when he was, say, manic but not psychotic? Well, I'd say I would start off by saying that he was l normal most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was, by all accounts, mm -hmm. um, dominated the room with his personality mm -hmm. and his intellect. Mm -hmm. So he was regarded by people, the, the great minds of the time, as someone who left them in the dust. So mm -hmm. he had this incredibly complex, interesting mind mm -hmm. and a personality that was always um, interested and involved and watching and observing. So again, I think that it's important that he, he was somebody who poetry was the most important thing to him mm -hmm. in life. He thought about it almost constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, he was married three times. Um, he was uh, attractive to women. He was a very good-looking man mm -hmm. and uh, obviously attracted to women. Mm -hmm. And so when he'd get manic, he would sort of lose control over all the sort of usual reins that people have on, on behavior. Mm -hmm. And he would often would have an affair mm -hmm. with someone, tell his wife he was going to get divorced, mm -hmm. um, you know, spend a lot of money, um, talk a lot. Um, and say things, as I said, as, that he, he went on to regret. Mm -hmm. So he, I think he, for a long time, people who didn't know him thought he was just a poet, you know, just a poet. You know, this mm -hmm. is what poets did. They were extravagant. They mm -hmm. talked a lot. Mm -hmm. They were consuming of the atmosphere. I think over time, people realized that he was sick. Right. And yeah. you know, that was very clear. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned that his work, you know, his poetry and letters and prose, you know, lend a lot of insight into his life, including his childhood um, and th the relationships he, that he had with his family and friends. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Um, he, he was friends with a lot of very famous people. He, he, right, he yeah. was. He was friends with m the leading poets of the time, mm -hmm. uh, including Elizabeth Bishop. He was deeply a New Englander and mm -hmm. deeply an American. Mm -hmm. And I think both of those things saturate his work. And in this day and age, one of the things that I'm, I, I wrote in the last chapter of my book about his great poem, For the Union Dead, which is about um, the saving grace of, of art, the cycles of valor and decay in the American character. Mm -hmm. um, but the great uh, history of America and the complex history of America. Mm -hmm. And I think he brought that complexity to everything, whether he was writing about friends or art or his wives or mm -hmm. his lovers or mm -hmm. his illness. He wrote about, he, he never shied away from difficult, complex things. And mm -hmm. to me, that's a, an astonishingly wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. There was no backing off. He, mm -hmm. he, whether in death, um, just right up against death, right mm -hmm. up against madness, right up against um, the problems of, mm -hmm. of this country, this great country. Yeah. Right, and in, in, in an era where people didn't necessarily say what they thought, you know, mm -hmm. or confront the kind of the issues that might be right in the room. No, they certainly didn't. And yeah. I mean, he got labeled, which he hated, and I think is completely unjustified, as mm -hmm. a confessional poet because he wrote about personal things and mm -hmm. he his book life studies kind of broke uh, expanded as, as one critic said expanded the territory of poetry it just mm -hmm. it just brought um, the personal mm -hmm. um, out there but the personal's always been in poetry I mean there'd yes. be no point to poetry right. were it not based uh, always as, at some level in the personal 
Okay. Um, but I think what he did do was talk, again, unflinchingly about things like being mad and about mm -hmm. depression. And so in, in my teachings at, at Johns Hopkins, teaching residents and medical students, mm -hmm. I often use his words and descriptions of depression and mania because they're so clear and they're so human. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get much of that in yeah. scientific writing, by definition. Right. I mean, no, and, and nor should you. I mean, you know, yes. so you, yeah. you have clinical writing for a reason. You, you, it's, it's appropriately so. But yeah. if you want to convey to someone what it feels like to be manic, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to rely on psychiatrists and psychologists to do that. No, you need a little bit of both. You, know, you need right. to know what it feels like to be in the head of someone you know, when they're in a manic phase or even when they're not and they're sort of dealing with the effects of medication or treatment, um, which, as right. you said, or are better with, but not ideal. Or with an yeah. illness. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I deal a lot with um, college students and mm -hmm. uh, middle school students who've, who have uh, gotten diagnosed, and they've, mm -hmm. got, they've got a long road ahead of them. You yeah. know, they've got a lot of things they've got to deal with, mm -hmm. contend with, uh, a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. to deal with. And, and there, I think what Lowell did when he was young uh, was always reach out to exemplars, to heroes, mm -hmm. to see h who used courage in mm -hmm. their life. How did they navigate life? Mm -hmm. And in many respects, in this day and age, we do that less. We we don't reach out so much to heroes. And mm -hmm. I think that you know, if you if you can give students or anybody who's got uh, bipolar illness or bad depression. Mm -hmm. uh, things that other what people have mm -hmm. been through, and some of the great poets have written about this extremely well. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one way of helping you navigate it. Mm -hmm. there, there have been other biographies, yeah, strict you know, kind of biographies of, of, of his life, and one was written by Ian Hamilton. Um, but, th but that seemed to have focused more on his illness as opposed to him as a person, a right. person, is that right? I, I know I, I think that. Focus, I think it was, it had a very judgmental quality to the book. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that m my sense of Lowell is more, much more sympathetic. Uh, mm -hmm. I admire him. Mm -hmm. uh, I admire what he contended with. I admire how he dealt with suffering. Mm -hmm and what the cards he was dealt. Um, I think Ian Hamilton judged him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Lowell's life was cha chaos often. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's the way of, mm -hmm. of, of this illness. But Hamilton overlooked, I think, a lot of the love that Lowell had, a lot of his mm -hmm. generosity, you know. Yes. Uh, and, and a lot of the love that he, that a lot of the people that loved him, I think right. it sounds like it didn't come out. Like his daughter uh, had said, this this did not give a picture of what it was like to actually be with him. I think that's true, and I mm -hmm. think that you know, um, his many people who knew him mm -hmm. from the time he was in school to the time he died. And several of his pallbearers were people he'd gone to school with. He he maintained mm. friendships, and and one of the things I was interested in his life was how can you maintain friendship mm -hmm. after going through so much chaos yes. and so much disruption. Mm -hmm. I think that's extraordinary. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, we write about heroes of different kinds, but from my point yeah. of view, you know, he was dealt an extraordinarily interesting hand mm -hmm. of privilege, social yes. privilege, being a Lowell in Boston. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and people tend to go on and on about that. And yes, it's true, and he was. Yeah. And he, much more importantly, was dealt a very high hand in terms of imagination mm -hmm. and, and poetry. Yes. But he was also dealt this incredibly difficult set of cards mm -hmm. of, of pain and suffering and humiliation yeah. and dread. Mm -hmm. and, um, and being born to a mother who made it clear she didn't want him. Yes, yes. His, his mother was no great war, bundle of warmth, you know. Right. I mean, she, uh, she was a cold, haughty um, woman who mm -hmm. probably tried in her own way to do things, mm -hmm. uh, but she, she, I don't think he, he ever felt kind of unconditional love that mm -hmm. people would like to have from their parents, yeah. from either parent. I think a closer relationship in some ways to his father, but mm -hmm. again, difficulties. But he was a difficult child. You know, I think this, his temperament was never an easy temperament. No, that would be difficult. And I think yeah. that to me, you know, you, you have people who are easy and who mm -hmm. kind of go through life being um, 
without a great deal of difficulty. And mm -hmm. Lowell was anything but. He was difficult. His poetry was difficult mm -hmm. uh, and wonderful, just extraordinarily wonderful man. I mean, I, I hated ending my book because I hated feeling like I was losing his company in a way. Yeah, you know? yeah. How did you first become interested in looking at his life from a, you know, as a, from the perspective of, of a psychologist? Uh, when I was 17, I had my f a severe breakdown mm -hmm. in high school and my senior year, and my English teacher um, never said anything to me about what he must have seen I'd gone through, mm -hmm. but he did say, here are a couple of books, and there are two volumes of poetry by Robert Lowell. Mm -hmm. He said, I think you might like him. And it's one of those times where you, you know, you remember exactly where you were when you read something. Yeah. Uh, I remember exactly where I was. When I and, I, and it was not because Lowell in any way says, you know, this is how to get through difficulty. I mean, he's no. completely unlike that. He's mm -hmm. not. But what he did show was that this great poem of his, The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket, um, this un violent force, mm -hmm. uncontrollable force, force across waters and mm -hmm. um, man and death and destruction. And what he did was, through great uh, art, mm -hmm. control it mm -hmm. and bring beauty to it. And there was something in that that instinctively seemed to me about mania that, you know, whether or not it could be controlled, you could do something with it, mm -hmm. and hopefully you would control it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just I, I never got over that. I, mm -hmm. I fell in love at that moment, and uh, mm. then years later, I, somebody asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to write a book about Robert Lowell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you started to touch on this before. Um, you were able to actually read his uh, medical records uh, right. with the permission of his daughter. Yes, that's right. Yeah. What um, what what are some of the things that stand out from the times with, that he was ill enough to be needing, you know, um, to be hospitalized? Well, I suppose what stood out. I mean, I I was looking at them as a clinician who specializes in in bipolar. So I was interested mm -hmm. in the patterning of his mania and mm -hmm. his depression and yeah. how it came over time and mm -hmm. response to treatment and so forth. So that was one aspect of it was the clinical side. What were mm -hmm. his symptoms and how did they evolve over time? Mm -hmm. um, but I was interested in how he looked at his illness. I mm -hmm. mean, you have this great perceiving mind. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot of people look at whatever illness they've got and, and it may be poignant, but it's not necessarily insightful. Mm -hmm. um, but you had this great capacity to observe something mm -hmm. in, in, in the context of the human condition, which mm -hmm. Lowell could do. So when he, Lowell looked at his mania, mm -hmm. um, it was in that light. And mm -hmm. I th think the terror that comes through in mm -hmm. his medical records, time after time after time with his doctors is, mm -hmm. I can't stand, it's going to come back, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, just heart-wrenching, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And also then his discussion of what relation he saw between his art mm -hmm. and his illness. Mm -hmm. And um, so mm -hmm. those are the main things I was interested in, mm -hmm. in looking at and his, with respect to his illness, right. what, what kind of patterning there was. Did he tend to get first manic and then start being very productive in terms mm -hmm. of poetry and then revise and so forth? Right. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you. And to our viewers, you've been watching Behind the Pages from the staff of 22 City View. I'm Diane Goshgarian. Yes, thank Great. you very much. You know, the other thing, too, I think that, you know, it sort of goes back to the idea that when you know something's possible, your brain finds a way to do it. And if you see a person like this who was